Coming up, a new airlock for the International Space Station. Another space tether problem. <laughs> All that and more. And Jared's got a great interview with Ralph Ewig of Odyssey. Stay with us. Tomorrow begins right now. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Orbit 10.06. I am Carrie, and with me is Jared and Mike and Adetta behind me. But at the top of the show, I want to make sure I give a huge shout out to all of our Patreon members. These are the Patreon people who are of the escape velocity. That's what I'm trying to read off of the screen. These are the people who have given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode. Ben says I spend too much time on this, so I'm talking really, really fast. These are the people who, of course, get access to our Slack channel, which is really awesome because it's like a weird insight to everyone's mind of what we're thinking about at any given point in time, sometimes about the show, sometimes not. In any case, if you would like to get your name talked over on the show, go head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. There. That was fast, right? Yeah. Okay. Very good. In case quick. I didn't cover this one more time, I'm Carrie, and this is Jared. <laughs> That's Mike. There's a Dutta. Woo! All right, Mike. So this is like, I have to point this out really, really quickly. It's one of the very few shows we don't open with launches. Yes. Yeah. It, it's this week it's or been last such a week. rare it's a occasion. Sad. It is a little bit sad, but that's okay. That's it's gonna start up again, and the next thing you know, there'll be no more space news. It'll only be launches for like <laughs> yes. ten minutes. So that's okay. I think that's what, that's gonna happen in the next week. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah, we have some cool ones next week that'll hopefully take off. So for sure. Be so awesome. in the meantime, give me some space news. What's going on in the International Space Station? Oh man, so this is some really cool news. So uh, NanoRax, which uh, builds uh, um, uh, experiment modules to go up to the International Space Station, mm -hmm. um, is teamed up with Boeing to build an airlock to deploy CubeSats and microsatellites. Oh. And this is a really awesome deal. What they're planning on doing, you can see in the picture there, they're going to uh, try to attach this to Node 3, uh, the Tranquility module. And uh, you can see the cupola there, and the port that they want to put the airlock on is actually occupied right now now by uh, one of the PMA adapters that was used to dock with the space shuttle. But that's going to be moved to the bottom port of the Node 2, the Harmony module, and that's going to be used for uh, commercial crew vehicles. So that'll free up that port for this commercial airlock. Now, they're hoping that it will be connected to the International Space Station by 2019. And by the way, they did announce this, uh, um, this whole deal on Monday. And it, just to be clear, it's not for uh, spacewalks by astronauts. It's not big enough for that. I was, you um, know what's really sad is I was going to ask because every time I hear airlock <laughs> I think just you know throw them out the airlock and so that's good no humans can get out of this one perfect thank you go on yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, with this um, uh, there is uh, the empty port that you can see on the kind of right hand side of the screen there is currently occupied by Bigelow's beam module the Bigelow uh, expandable activity module and that hopefully will have an extended stay and hopefully will might still be there when uh, they finally do attach this module in 2019, and hopefully there's no delays with it. And uh, it'll be able to be delivered uh, to the International Space Station in the trunk of the uh, Dragon cargo vessel. And uh, after the uh, the PMA-3 um, is moved to the uh, port on Node 2, the bottom port on Node 2, uh, then that'll help to uh, uh, free that up, and, and hopefully there's just more stuff that happens. I mean, there was a, an announcement a couple months ago that on the Columbus module on the European side, there's going to have a uh, experiment rack that's going to go there. So I'm just really excited excited about all these commercial updates and ways that we can utilize the space station for uh, the last remaining years of its service and hopefully we can even extend it out a little bit. And I like that picture there because it kind of demonstrates a lot how uh, it will actually open. And I mean, it's just going to slide open and then whatever payload they have in, inside will be able to uh, deploy from there. So nice. hopefully a lot of cool missions will happen from this. So Destructor 1701 is saying, uh, looking at this airlock, I see the grapple fixture, but where's the door? Um, I, yeah, I was kind of having trouble finding that as well. So this is, it connects to the International Space Station via the node and the, I, presumably there's a door between the two? Is that yeah, there's there's a do, there's a door between the two. The type of uh, um, port that it's going to go to is one of the berthing ports, not one of the docking ports. Okay. Um, and they're going to have a special mechanism, kind of like on the Kibo module, how they have mechanisms on the pressurized section so that the astronauts can load whatever CubeSat or, or small satellite they're going to go into and then put it 
into the airlock all the way, close the hatch on their side, and then the hatch, I'm assuming, will slide open um, from uh, the front there and deploy whatever satellite that they have in there. So uh, that's going to be really cool. And uh, that graphic you saw just a moment ago is the current configuration of the space station right now. So nice. very cool. And these are just CubeSats and, and NanoSats and all, any sort of tiny little thing that a NanoRack would normally yeah, sort of. It's going to be bigger than the uh, the Kibo airlock, um, so they will be able to put uh, some a couple of larger payloads in there. Just all depends on what experiments uh, they have in there. But um, I'm not sure the exact uh, dimensions for it. Sure. But they definitely will be able to get you know your micro satellite size, which is actually bigger than than a CubeSat, and you could potentially have like a 12 unit CubeSat uh, deployed from this, which nice. is you know the biggest the biggest configuration that they have of those so far. So nice. Awesome. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Jared. Yeah. Yes. Speaking of <laughs> more things in space. <laughs> eh? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about removing some of those more things from yeah, space. Yeah, because, yeah, that's mm. kind of an issue, or at least it's going to be. Lots of things. Yeah. So the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's uh, resupply ship, the HTV-6, uh, attempted a space debris experiment, but uh, unfortunately that experiment failed. Um, now, HTV-6 was launched on December 9th, 2016, with about... 4,000 kilograms of supplies and experiments and six lithium ion batteries to upgrade the International Space Station's power systems. And once all that was outloaded, they did the typical thing you do with a resupply ship, which is that they loaded it with trash and they also put nine unneeded batteries uh, back into it before they released it on January 27th. Now, HTV-6 was to have released a 700 meter long tether to test a technique to deorbit space debris. And this tether would, uh, would have used uh, what's called electro electroconductivity in order to see if they could use it to actually slow down uh, HTV-6. And an experiment was called Kunatori Integrated Tether Experiment, and Space Mike or the Internet can correct me um, <laughs> if I got that correct no, right? or wrong. Um, I believe so. Now, um, <laughs> yeah, kunatori, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, which I believe means uh, stork in Japanese. Yeah, stork, yeah, exactly. So beautiful yes. that they were able to name it that. Now, um, one of the four bolts that was holding down the end mass of the tether did not release. So unfortunately, this experiment, which was to see if you actually could use a tether to slow down uh, satellites to eventually deorbit them, they didn't get to do it. So hopefully they'll be able to pick that up on another mission coming up because I think there's still a couple HTVs left and it'd be really cool to see them do that. But unfortunately, this attempt at the experiment has failed. That's so Interesting. sad. Interesting. Yeah. But that's, that's the seems way like it works. There's always, it seems like there's always problems whenever there's some sort of tether experiment. Do you remember that uh, space shuttle mission where they did a, a tether mission and it got like uh, like electrically charged and detached from the space shuttle and they had all those weird like uh, um, like lights flying around it and stuff like that? There's always yeah. something weird whenever they do tether experiments. Yeah, it seems <laughs> like they've not had a lot of uh, good... Uh, <laughs> good experiments with tethers in space. It always seems like something <laughs> like something snaps, it can't get it to spin up to proper speed, the bolt won't unlock. It always seems like there's always something that goes on with that. So it's <laughs> <laughs> weird. Walk, walk. <laughs> so, dog on it. Ironic Aw, shucks. Ironically, that was the sound the bolt made. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> moving right along. Not for this to be a depressed episode, because that is not what we're trying to go for. Uh, Mike, you've got some DARPA news. Tell me some more about what's going yeah. on here. So uh, speaking of experiments in space, uh, uh -huh. um, DARPA formally announced on uh, Thursday that they have awarded a contract to Space Systems Laurel to build the satellite bus for a satellite resurfacing mission. Mm -hmm. And with this, they're planning on building uh, satellites that would have uh, arms that would be able to connect to a satellite in geosynchronous orbit, potentially move it around to different orbits, upgrade it if need be with new equipment, and uh, even like uh, repair any sort of faulty uh, uh, instruments like that. Like even in the picture that you see there, like there's several times where a solar panel won't deploy, mm -hmm. and that would be great to be able to deploy that and get the full amount of uh, uh, service out of whatever satellite was was launched. Now, with this, uh, there actually is a little bit of drama around this, but before I get into that, I do just want to explain a little bit more about the program. It's officially called the Robotic Servicing of Geosynchronous Satellites, or the RSGS program, and it'll not only be capable of inspecting the satellites and reboosting them, but you know, doing the simple repairs on them, and it's expected to launch or 
or at least be built by uh, 2021. Now, this program also complements a satellite servicing mission that NASA is doing called Restore L. And both of them aim to uh, provide service and refuel satellites if possible. Now, the drama that I mentioned earlier has to do with Orbital ATK, which filed a lawsuit on Tuesday against DARPA saying that their program violates U.S. policies, which prohibit government from competing with the commercial sector. Now, what you see on your screen right now is Orbital ATK's mission extension vehicle. And their plan isn't necessarily to refuel a satellite, but to take over its propulsion and maneuvering capabilities for a satellite to augment it. Now, the reason why they're having such a problem with the DARPA uh, announcement with uh, awarding their contract to Space Systems Laurel, which, by the way, is a $15 million fixed price contract, which I love, mm -hmm. and they believe that Space Systems Laurel will have an unfair advantage because they'll be able to use that spacecraft, the, uh, the DARPA experiment spacecraft, for commercial use that is paid for by DARPA once the demo mission is complete. So uh, right now, they're kind of having to, NASA and DARPA are both kind of having to figure out what the aftermath of some of these demo experiments will be. And after the mission is over, will everything transfer over to Space Systems Laurel, or will it still be a DARPA satellite? There's ah. a lot of questions that need to be answered mm. so that all the parties involved are happy and we don't have a government program competing with the commercial sector and giving unfair advantage to you know, different companies. So, um, I mean, <laughs> I feel like if Orbital ATK had won the contract, I, I wonder how uh, things would be playing out right now. But, I mean, at the same time, they do have a good point. So we're just going to have to wait and see how this uh, works out. But in any case, hopefully this will launch in 2021 and we'll be able to save a lot of satellites out there that uh, either have had minor problems that shorten their life a little bit or still have you know perfectly good hardware that just need a little bit of fuel to um, keep their station keeping abilities and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I'm excited about like stuff like this. I want to be able to reuse as much stuff in space as possible. So I really like programs like this. Anyway. That's what's going on with, with uh, DARPA and, and Orbital. Yeah, that's really, that's super messy. I guess I didn't even think about it like that because it, you know, as, as space geeks, as space nerds, you know, we all, uh, you know, all ships rise in the tides, right? So we want mm -hmm. these things. It's like, oh, it's just the one. It's okay. You just go over there and pull it out. It'll be fine. Like, not a big deal. Like, yeah. all those sorts of things. Like, we're really excited about yeah. this being an idea. And then it's like, okay, fine. Well, you helped. And then what? Now is it yours? Is it or what's going on? Like, that's... That's a, I never even yeah. thought about it like that. It's that's very interesting. Um Hopefully, and something yeah. else too with this is is uh, the the part that has all the robotic arms that'll actually be doing the servicing. That's going to be built by DARPA. So uh, we haven't seen the contract yet, but I don't think they're going to be transferring that technology over to Space Systems Laurel. They're just providing the satellite bus for this. So right. there might not even be any sort of technology transfer. But right. there's still the question of what happens to that particular satellite once the demo mission is over. Yeah. So, gotcha. See. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. All right. This is like a really heavy news segment, you yeah. guys. <laughs> what a downer. <laughs> All right, Jared, um, I don't think this one's going to make us much happier, but that's okay. Uh, tell me more. <laughs> well, no, this is a very happy story to me. It, all right. Yeah, well, it's it's cooperation. It's, yeah, it's cooperation. <laughs> it's carpooling to orbit. Carpooling or to orbit. Or rocket pooling, whatever oh, you wow. prefer. Oh, uh, oh, oh. But Iridium <laughs> and NASA uh, are actually going to be hitching a ride together in 2018. And five Iridium satellites and NASA's... Uh, gravity recovery and climate experiment follow on twin satellites will be flying on a single Falcon 9 in 2018. Now those five Iridium satellites are going to be deployed into the Iridium constellation while Grace follow on, which is what we're going to call it, is a collaboration yeah. between NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the German Research Center for Geosciences. Now what that mission does is it tracks changes in the Earth's gravitational field and when it does you can see things like where's water going, um, how's the climate changing and other things like that. Now, um, GRACE is a mission that's currently operating, so it's basically the same system, except GRACE follow-on is going to be a little bit more sensitive. So GRACE follow-on is going to be launched into a polar orbit about 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, and there's going to be a 220 kilometer gap between the two satellites, and laser ranging systems will detect changes of distances by two thousandths of a millimeter that's over that crazy. 220 kilometer gap. So that's literally wow. 
you know, uh, a human hair has more width than that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very sensitive, sensitive laser instrumentation that they have on board of that. And it's one of my favorite missions because it makes those weird looking gravity maps of the Earth where yeah. like the Earth is bulging out of one side and it's compressed in the other. And it's just, it's great with all the data that we can get from it and it's great that you can actually now ride share if you will there you these go. missions together so nice. so <laughs> yeah. like, and these are going to be the Irid iridium next satellites right yes iridium next yeah interesting so, this is a part I of the find it really interesting i wonder if the uh, the grace satellites are built by the same people because they have that same kind of like uh, half step pyramid design so that they can uh, have all of them in there so like i wonder if we'll even be able to tell the difference when we see pictures of them like putting all the uh, yeah. uh, satellites together in the payload if I we can tell know. the difference between the iridium next and the grace satellites i do know great <laughs> the grace satellites are being built by airbus defense so I don't I don't think the Iridium ones are being built by Airbus Defense. So that's what that's at least what I know right. about them. So it right. makes sense yeah. though that they're both the same same shape. It'll it'll be yeah. a nice fit. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally where those contracts are made, right? Well, I don't know. What's yours look like? What's yours look like? What's yeah, yours look that'll, like? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. look, they're the okay, same. Cool. How big's yours? <laughs> hey, you're, yeah, yours is the same size, but we can we can fit it in here, Tetra style. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. <sighs> Some more slightly sad news, although everyone is safe. Mike, tell me about a tornado. Yeah, we're talking about a tornado that uh, struck down uh, in East New Orleans to the uh, Michoud uh, uh, Assembly Facility. Um, and this is NASA's facility that is building uh, the Space Launch System core stages and the Orion capsule. And holy cow, this happened on Tuesday at 17.25 Coordinated Universal Time. And just check this out. You can see the tornado engulfing one of the buildings there. And like you said, NASA has accounted for all 3,500 employees who worked at the site. However, five of them did sustain minor injuries. Um, now, most of the hardware that is used to construct Orion and the Space Launch System, along with a really big one-of-a-kind vertical weld tool needed to fuse together the tanks for it, were pretty much undamaged. However, the roofs of those buildings that that hardware is, is uh, kept in uh, have been damaged and workers are really busy to try to uh, plug a lot of the holes there and to protect the e equipment uh, while they're trying to restore power to the facility. Now um, the uh, Pegasus barge, which is a reconverted ship that is used to transport the uh, uh, core stage and was previously used for the shuttle external tanks as well, also was able to weather the storm and is pretty much uh, relatively undamaged. And uh, that's going to be transporting the, the stages from uh, New Orleans to Cape Canaveral. So uh, kind of a lucky break that this uh, tornado which caused a lot of damage uh, to uh, you know, nearby New Orleans. And there was about 200 cars in the parking lot. And there's a picture here that you'll see in just a moment that uh, kind of shows an example of uh, how some of these cars were demolished there. But it really is amazing that there uh, wasn't any uh, sort of casualties and that they were able to get out really quickly. I mean, they're, they are prepared for this. I mean, the last time that they had you know some major damage to the Michoud uh, 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 assembly facility was back in Hurricane Katrina. And there's that picture I was talking oh, about. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Holy cars smokes. that just smashed there, yeah. So there's a lot of hardware on the outside that uh, has been destroyed. And in fact, there one of the test articles wow. for the shuttle external tank uh, actually flew in the air for a little while before crashing down. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any pictures of that. But that's just a, that's pretty crazy and kind of sad that that uh, piece of hardware, which we were never going to use again, it was just going to on display. I mean, that was just used to make sure that we could stack, you know, the solid rocket boosters and the space shuttle together right. um, back before we actually started. I mean, even before we started doing like the Enterprise uh, free flying test so wow still kind, of, still kind of sad but you know all the hardware all the important hardware to to move forward with the space launch system on orion was undamaged so i feel like this is a pretty lucky break and that no one was seriously hurt either so. yeah totally yeah <sighs> that's some scary stuff crazy crazy all right and then to finish off space news jared of course you would pull this one out you yes. uh, you got <laughs> a bit of a brain teaser as it yes. were Something's wrong on Mars, and we really can't, and we have a problem kind of trying to figure out what it is. So there's this very big mystery that's happening on Mars. Thanks to the various missions that have gone to Mars, we know that there's water that was once on the surface of Mars. And not only was there water, it was liquid water, and there was a lot of liquid water on the surface of Mars. But 
new data from Curiosity seems to be contradicting what we would expect in order for the conditions for liquid water to exist there. So scientists hypothesized that Mars had a very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere that allowed this water to be a liquid. And one of the key things in order for liquid water to exist is you have to have the right temperature range and you have to have a certain amount of pressure so that the, the atmosphere or whatever is generating the pressure pushes the molecules together so it allows water's liquid state to form. Now, this would, this would lead to carbonates, a type of chemical interaction between the atmosphere and the water mm -hmm. to be found in rock samples. But to the surprise of all of these scientists, there are no carbonates being found in rock samples from Curiosity's instruments. So this mm. is not exactly a new surprise for scientists. Uh, they've known about this since we started sampling the surface even as far back as the Viking spacecraft. Um, but this is an extra piece of data for the puzzle to try to figure out how Mars could have had liquid water without a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. So now what we've got to do is we've got to go back to our models and look at everything and see if we need to maybe modify those models a little bit to try to figure out what the big deal is here. Maybe we need to put more hydrogen in the atmosphere, or maybe we need to uh, put more argon in the atmosphere, or some other, something other than carbon dioxide in order to allow that thickness of the atmosphere to be, or yeah, the thickness of the atmosphere to be there. So uh, hmm. just a little cosmic puzzle that Mars kind of likes to throw at us every time we go and study it. So. Interesting. Interesting. All right, something That'd be really little, surprising. Huh? <laughs> That'd be really surprising if it is like one of those rare gases like argon that was like plentiful there. That would just be yeah, amazing. That would be bizarre right. and but very awesome at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah. That is. That's yeah, that's crazy interesting. Okay, so that wraps up news, which means we're gonna take a break, which means I get to and then when we come back, Mike gets to sit down too, I suppose. Jared also gets to sit down, and Dunn is yes. always sitting down, so that's everybody's status <laughs> now. You've got it. Uh, Jared is going to come back and have an interview with Ralph Ewig, who is the CEO of Audacity Space. We're going to be talking about like a teacher sort of situation going on. Y'all yeah. are going to have to explain this to me. Yeah. We'll, like, we'll I, we'll I've got it. questions. I think we'll talk about it in great detail. Perfect. So, sounds pretty good to me. All right, good. So, we'll so awesome. stay with us. That's coming up next. Hello and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get to our interview, of course, we want to thank all of the patrons of Tomorrow by starting with our patrons of the Escape Velocity variety who give us $10 or more per episode. They get access to our Slack channel and all the other fun things that we do. But we've also got our Orbital members. These folks give us anywhere from $5 to $9.99 per episode. They get free worldwide swag store shipping. So if you want to buy something from us, you get free shipping from anywhere in the world with it. Isn't that awesome? I think it's pretty awesome. So if you would like to help contribute and crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, consider heading on over to patreon.com slash tmro. Now, I've got a very interesting interview here today. I'm, a lot of you know I'm a recovering aerospace engineer, so this is, uh, this is very, very fascinating to me. I've got Ralph Ewig from Odyssey Space with us today. He's the CEO. Welcome to tomorrow, and welcome to our observation deck, Ralph. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the invitation. Um, but yeah, it's actually just Odyssey. So we, uh, we use Odyssey Space on our domain name, but the company name is just Odyssey. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll go ahead and stick with Odyssey because, I mean, that just sounds pretty <laughs> awesome uh, to begin with. So, Ralph, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, we can start there. Um, actually, I was born in Germany, so if you want to say it, I'm a, I'm a German rocket scientist, which is something I like to uh, use on the dating scene um, when I was still dating, now I'm married, but anyway. So I uh, yeah, born in Germany, um, I came to the United States in, in 92 and went to uh, Seattle uh, University of Washington to get a PhD in aerospace engineering. 
Um, since then, I've worked in pretty much every space company that's out there. I've been around quite a bit. Uh, but most recently, I worked at SpaceX for about three years. And then from there, I went back to school at Stanford to get a business degree. And that's where I started Odyssey with my two co-founders. And that brings us to today. Excellent. So, uh, of course, why don't we just go right into it. Tell us a little bit about Odyssey, because uh, as I was researching um, the company and you and, and everybody with it, uh, it was fascinating reading your Tumblr that you had, uh, where all those little updates happened, and that was just fantastic um, to see the documentation of it like that. So just tell us a little bit about Odyssey. Yeah, Odyssey was an interesting idea. It really started when I was at SpaceX. Uh, my, my role at SpaceX was uh, uh, mission operations, so um, I was working in the mission operations room uh, and my primary responsibility was for communications. Now because uh, Dragon, or Flying Dragon to the International Space Station is a NASA mission, we had access to an existing relay system that NASA uses called TDRS, or TDRS, which stands for Telemetry and Data Relay System. But essentially I saw the contrast between being able to operate with continuous connectivity using that system versus using a collection of ground stations, which was the alternative when it wasn't available. And I thought, this is brilliant. People should do this all the time, why don't they? And, and of course the answer was you can't because Teeters was not meant for commercial use primarily. It's uh, mostly used by the government and, uh, and very little capacity is available for commercial use. So the idea was like, hey, here's a commercial opportunity, let's pursue this. And um, I went to Stanford to understand the whole money thing. Um, got a degree in business, so I moved to the dark side being an engineer myself. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, you saw this journey on my, on my Tumblr blog, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was humble beginnings of just three guys, uh, myself and my two co-founders, and, uh, and now we're a team of 14 and still growing, which is great. So how important is uh, having data relay for spacecraft? Is it, is it as important as certain other aspects of designing a spacecraft? It's an interesting problem. Um, in, the, in the past, most of the activity in space has been in the geostationary belt. So if you're looking at geostationary satellites, um, that's that special orbit where you appear to be standing still in the sky. And in that case, you have line of sight between the satellite and your ground station, so it's easy to maintain connectivity. Um, however, more recently, with the move to smaller and smaller satellites, um, a lot of the activity has taken place in not geostationary orbits. So we're looking at low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, and then also going beyond geostationary to, to the moon potentially. The challenge there is that um, in a low orbit you're going around the planet once every 90 minutes approximately and you only have connectivity as you have line of sight over your ground station and that window can be as short as 15 minutes. So you have this intermittent way of operating where you get a little bit of connectivity, you have to wait, you get a little bit of connectivity and it's, uh, it's very um, hindering in terms of commercial use of your space assets. So when it comes to getting more value out of the things that you put into space or just bringing astronauts closer to the audience, being able to see in real time what's going on, connectivity actually has a huge play in this. So what kind of services is Odyssey looking to deliver to the industry? In the simplest sense, you can think of us as a cell phone company for space. So we're literally like a cell phone network, except that our users are people that own and operate objects in space rather than phones on the ground. And um, Pete Borden at, at NASA Ames actually once coined this phrase, which we like to use, which is, um, we provide a dial tone in space. That's really all it is. So it's just that simple. Uh, you can take a piece of equipment with you on your satellite, launch vehicle, space station, what have you, and, uh, and just connect to the ground and then via the internet to anybody on the planet in real time. And we just build you by the minute, just like a cell phone carrier would. Awesome, literally like cell phone communications in space. So, um, so would you be able to actually like sort of call up, if you will, um, a certain satellite or would you be able to c communicate between satellites using your network? Yeah, we can do both. So um, the system is pretty flexible. It's uh, symmetric in data speed, so you can have the same throughput going out on forward link or coming back on return link. And we can connect actually satellites to each other as well. So there are a lot of use cases which uh, people are still discovering, which we hadn't even thought of, that uh, are enabled by this. And, and that's really the point. We want to make space as accessible and as easy to use as possible. And communications is one of those things that everybody takes for granted on the ground, but it's actually quite hard once you're up there. So how does Odyssey intend to deliver these services? Because um, it, it sounds like it's, it might be a, quite a challenge in order to do something like that. So how do you intend to deliver the data relay services? Yeah, it is an undertaking of a considerable size to, to some degree. Um, essentially, we're building what, what I 
I like to call it interplanetary infrastructure. Um, it sounds really cool when you're trying to recruit people. So, um, by the way, if you're looking <laughs> for a job, anybody out there, we are hiring, so feel free to apply. But um, aside from that, um, the way this works is we, we deploy three satellites of our own, which go into a specialized orbit, um, mostly above of the LEO crowd. It's a medium of orbit, approximately 20,000 kilometers out from Earth. And um, those three satellites act like a relay system. And uh, you can see in the picture here, then in a very special orbit, um, this orbit is called a 3 by one harmonic resonance orbit. What that means is it goes around the planet um, three times in the time the Earth rotates once. So 3 by one harmonic resonance. And uh, the reasons for that placement were, were in part um, tied to regulatory um, uh, matters, to um, technical feasibility, but also economic viability. And then with those three ground, I mean three satellites and, and two ground stations, we'll be able to achieve continuous connectivity for pretty much anywhere between solid ground to the distance of lunar orbit. So just uh, to go into our chat room real quick, because uh, our, our viewers often ask really cool questions. Um, we got Andrew Shire who wants to know, are these satellites that are owned or are they leased in terms of uh, the communication time that you get on them? So we actually own and operate these satellites. We launched them in early 2019. And um, we will just use them like a cell phone tower um, in the sense that you can just pay by the minute in terms of um, whatever capacity you require to do whatever it is that you want to do. But they're owned and operated by Odyssey, the company, ourselves. Excellent. And we've got another one from Chris Radcliffe, which says, uh, can existing satellites use the Odyssey network or does it require new hardware? That is an excellent question. Um, it is tricky for existing satellites to use our network. Um, either you have to put a piece of hardware on your satellite, which we call the client terminal, um, this is essentially the phone, or um, for more sophisticated satellites, we can provide you a specification and then that uh, owner operator can change their satellite to be compliant. Uh, some of the, the more sophisticated satellites have the ability to reprogram their radios to do so. But in most cases, I'm guessing 90% of the time, it will be a, a new satellite or a new platform, launch vehicle, um, space station, etc. Very cool. Now, sort of going back to t uh, talking about Tedris a little bit, what, are the, what is sort of the primary difference between you, uh, Odyssey and Tedris? Is it just the commercial aspect of it? Or is it the approach to it? Or what, what's the primary difference between you and Tedris? Yeah, good question. So there's a couple of things. Um, the first one is, is the placement. Uh, a lot of the activity in space now is moving towards smaller and smaller satellites, smaller spacecraft. And we wanted to be able to serve even very small spacecraft, so down to a CubeSat size, which is literally just a cube, 10 centimeters on the side. And uh, those kinds of um, platforms have very low power. So for them, it's challenging to close a link at a meaningful throughput all the way from uh, LEO orbit to geostationary and then from there back down to Earth. So in that sense, um, placing ourselves in a medium of orbit was a key enabler that allows us to serve very small, low-powered devices as clients. Um, the other challenge with, with Tetris is that the architecture wasn't initially set out to serve a large number of users. Uh, it was designed originally just for space shuttle and space station, which was two users. Uh, it can do more than that today, but it's still in the dozens, not in the hundreds. And uh, our system can literally serve thousands of users simultaneously because it's built just like a cell phone network in that regard. Yeah, and one of our uh, users in our chat room wants to know what are the speeds that you're going to be able to deliver in terms of communication? Yeah, throughput um, speeds are very interesting uh, and obviously on top of people's mind when we talk to our customers. <laughs> um, the answer is, as always, it depends. Uh, but it does depend on the capabilities of the client um, and, and it scales with the amount of power the client can put through it. But to give you some examples, um, we have a couple of reference designs which we do for typical types of client. Uh, we can put about 5 megabits per second through it for a CubeSat type client. And then in our second generation, which will go up in 2021, we can go as high as 2 gigabits per second for a, a larger platform, which could be a space station or a larger spacecraft. So it really depends on the um, power output of the, of the receiving node on both ends. But uh, the system is flexible enough to accommodate that based on both needs and, uh, and capability of the client. Yeah, if I heard you correctly earlier, you were talking about your services not necessarily being limited to low Earth orbit or even geo, maybe going out further. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so part of the, the beauty of the system is that we designed it. It does what it does with a combination of both the relay satellites and the ground assets, which are the, the ground stations we plan on, on putting up. Um, our first two will be um, San Francisco and Singapore. Uh, downstream, we'll do a third one in Europe, uh, most likely in Luxembourg. 
and then we might add more as, as we need it. But um, the idea is that as you build the system, as you use the system, um, from the customer's perspective or the client's perspective, uh, you just need one piece of hardware and it transitions between different modes of operation depending on where you are. If you're close in in a lower orbit, we use the relay satellites to connect you. Once you go beyond that, we can actually serve you directly from the ground. But you can use that same piece of hardware and it just works. Uh, you can even roam between networks, which is our network versus NASA Tetris, ideally. And that's something we're looking to uh, establish with uh, NASA in collaboration as well. So who are you, are you expecting your primary customers to be? Is it just going to be small little CubeSats uh, that are in low Earth orbit? Or are you expecting to maybe uh, potentially compete with uh, Tedris as politely as you can uh, with them and their, their work that they do? Yeah, it's an interesting mix. When we started this, it was a little bit like um, building the internet in space. And we did not nearly foresee all the uses that people have come up with already. And I'm guessing there will still be many more um, potential applications people will develop as we go. But um, in terms of what these clients look like, it starts with you know the obvious one, which is um, CubeSat platforms doing Earth imaging and smaller satellites, uh, 100 kilogram to 200 kilogram range. But then anybody who takes imagery of the Earth or measurements of some kind and sells it, um, their customers are telling them, we want the stuff as real time as we can get it. So if the data is uh, literally real time, it is considerably more valuable than if it's two or three hours old. So as one of them goes into it, that means the next one has to go into it in order to compete. And we're looking at larger customers, such established companies who have been around for a long time in the Earth imaging business. And then beyond Earth imaging, you get launch companies too. Um, when you're flying a rocket, you have that same challenge. Once it's over the horizon, you don't know if you can connect to it anymore, especially since they go over water. And, uh, and you want to know what it's doing, so we can provide that service as well. And then uh, you get all the way up to space stations, um, both the current International Space Station, but also potentially private space stations as they come into being. So is this going to be only open to U.S. launch customers, or is this sort of, you guys are going to be open arms to everyone who wants um, any kind of communication capability while in space? We are a global company. Uh, we actually have subsidiaries both in Europe and in Singapore and Asia, and we cater to anybody on the planet. So um, we're very agnostic in terms of the customer and um, also in terms of the data. It's just like an internet service provider. We don't ever see your data. So it tests just bits and uh, we will pick it up and deliver it to you um, wherever you are. Um, now, what's your expected time frame for the implementation of the communications network? Yeah, we have a roadmap uh, for the company. It was actually quite public. It's on our website and you can see um, progress in real time. Uh, which is something people like to um, actually point out. It's kind of cool. You can see on any given day what the percentage of completion is for that roadmap. Um, but essentially, each phase is about a year long and has specific goals attached to it. Uh, we'll start the uh, construction of our first ground station this year, and we have a demo mission going up this year as well. Um, we booked a flight on a, on a SpaceX Falcon 9 in December, and uh, for secondary payload, it's just a small CubeSat. Um, but that will prove out the, um, the terminal that goes on the customer side and the ground station network. And then next year we built the second ground station in Singapore and then the actual relay constellation will go up in, in 2019. Excellent, that's, that's super exciting that you guys are gonna be flying hardware uh, t towards the end of this year, is that what you said? Yeah, that's the current plan, December this year. Yeah, awesome. And um, of course, speaking of SpaceX, our chat room is always infatuated uh, with SpaceX and the work that they're doing. Um, so Johnny Spacer asks, uh, isn't SpaceX pursuing internet communication satellites? And would that be sort of a competitor with Odyssey? So I guess the question is, do you have any potential competition coming up? And what may set you apart from that competition? Yeah, when we started this three years ago, um, about three years ago, it, it was very speculative and not a lot of people thought this market might be real. Um, so at the time, they weren't paying much attention, but um, now as the industry keeps growing very rapidly, this has become a real headache. We are actually on the cover of Space News Magazine a while back because they realized this is a big concern and they're looking for a solution. Um, and then, yeah, so we have competitors. We're not the only people pursuing it, obviously. Um, there are big established players who are trying to repurpose existing satellites already in geostationary orbit, uh, but that's challenging based on the, the reasons I gave previously. They're in the wrong place, a little too far out, and they weren't built for this purpose. Uh, and the technology is actually quite quite difficult. Um, and then there are new players coming into um, into the market as well. There's other startups pursuing this with different architectures. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, you mentioned SpaceX building a, a very large network of satellites. Um, and there's a couple more doing the same thing. Um, these are what I call 
Internet in the Sky applications. So there is a couple of projects underway, both from SpaceX, OneWeb, and there's some out of Europe as well, where they're trying to provide Internet service or Wi-Fi anywhere on the planet. Um, so their market is a little different than space to ground, whereas ours is space to space. So I do see them as complementary solutions, not as competitors. Yeah, awesome. Now, uh, another one from our chat room from Green Jim 2 asks, how long will Odyssey satellites last, and will there be on-orbit spares eventually for your network? Yeah, we uh, originally started this with um, commercial telecommunications platform satellites, so very standard things like a bus you can buy from a, a big aerospace giant and then put a specialized payload on it. And typical lifetime for these things is on the order of 15 years. Um, but then that was very expensive. You know, as a startup, it's hard to, to raise enough money to put that kind of infrastructure in play. You have to essentially build a railroad in entirety before you can sell the first ticket, which is a challenging undertaking. So we shrunk it down a little bit. We now have two generations planned. The first generation uh, going up in 2019 has a lifetime of about 10 years. And then the second generation, which would be two to three years later, if the, the um, pickup is such that the market supports it, uh, would again be a longer lifetime, um, 10 to 12 years. But um, typical lifetimes for, for these satellites are on the order of 15 years in geo. We're in medium of orbit, which is a little more harsher in terms of the environment. So you look at about 10 years lifetime. Um, and just to sort of to take a question from our chat room and to paraphrase it a little bit, is there a specific reason why you chose uh, the three areas for your ground stations? Is it because of that 120 degrees of coverage um, sort of with that there? Or is there, or is there other reasons that you're able to choose those places? Yeah, the selection of the, the ground locations was, um, was pretty involved. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but you mentioned one which is, which is true. So orbital mechanics, right? We want to be approximately in opposite sides to the planet um, because we do want to cover long distance communications from the ground. We need approximately evenly spaced locations around the planet. And uh, um, San Francisco or US West Coast, Singapore and, and Europe um, was a good combination of those three. Um, other things are, are um, connectivity on the ground. It's actually surprising, most people may not think of it that way as well, is even once you get your signal to the ground, getting it back to where the person is that wants it, can be a challenge. So if you have a ground station in the middle of um, um, Alaska or, or um, the South Pole, which is great from an orbital mechanics point of view, it's very difficult to get high through the internet in those locations. And um, what we looked at and, and realized was that the strongest mission critical internet connectivity is available in financial centers and then of course in Silicon Valley. And, and that drove some of the selection, um, selection process as well. And then last but not least, we wanted a good business climate and um, access to talent. It takes people to do this, and having a location with lots of good people that are excited about space and, and are well educated makes a big difference. Yeah, and to take another uh, question from our, our chat room and to kind of paraphrase it from Paco De Niro, um, he's wondering about any thoughts on laser communication. So um, I guess to make this a two-part uh, question, what are your thoughts on laser communications? And uh, are you guys interested in potentially using that? Or are you guys going to be sticking with the, the tried and true RF? No, that's a good point. Um, laser is an upcoming technology and it's super capable. It's very interesting to us. Um, the challenge with laser is you can get very high throughput speeds, but you can only get it again to a limited number of clients. Um, if you were using that for the final link, which is from the relay to the client spacecraft, you get limited in the number of satellites you can serve simultaneously by how many beams you can create simultaneously, or you have to go to a scanning solution. So radio has this advantage that it is more ubiquitous and you can actually um, use it to serve thousands of customers. The other challenge with laser is that going transatmospheric, which is from space to ground, has both safety implications for aircraft travel and weather implications. So it's tricky to make that to work on a reliable basis. However, where it is very potent is in space communications. So we're actually looking at laser as a technology to connect our relays to each other. Uh, in that case, we have you know three to six satellites, and, and that gives you small enough a number that laser makes a lot of sense. And it doesn't have to go through the atmosphere, which is also a great advantage. So laser is a, is a great technology, and we'll definitely keep trying to integrate that into a system as it evolves. So what are some of the difficulties that you've experienced as, a, as an up-and-coming company? <laughs> there are many. Uh, being a startup is tough. Um, there are many things that can go wrong for, for any young company. And uh, you know, SpaceX made it look easy, but uh, it, is, it is challenging. I think for us, you know, in the beginning, it was really just trying to get people on board. Uh, there's a saying that says, uh, if the difference between a, a great leader and a nut job on a hill is that you have followers. If you have one follower, <laughs> you're a great leader. 
if you roll by yourself, then you just did not job standing on a soapbox. So um, that that was the first challenge. Um, once I got my co-founders on board, um, we you know, growing the company, uh, trying the resources, trying to find the resources to support us and, and keep growing, has been has been tricky. And uh, we struggle with all the same things that any young company does. Um, anything from how to process payroll to finding an office space to uh, getting talent. It's um, pretty similar to any startup. So uh, specifically to talk a little bit more about being a startup, what are some of the extra challenges that you have to deal with being a startup in the space industry? Because the space, uh, you know, from my little bit of aerospace background that I have, I know, oh my gosh, it is an immensely difficult uh, area to break through into. So what are some of the extra challenges that you have to contend with as a startup, specifically in the space industry? I think the two biggest hurdles are, one, that space still is very expensive. So you have to raise a lot of funding in order to do what you want to do. And it takes a, a lot of upfront effort before you can get to the point of actually being profitable. Uh, and the second one is that the, the space industry as a whole is still pretty risk averse. So trying something new and different is, uh, is a challenge. Um, convincing our customers, which range anywhere from startups themselves to very established and, and um, older aerospace companies, to actually try something new and, um, and prove that we have the credibility to pull it off, uh, that's tough. And it takes a lot of um, very smart people to, to come up with some very solid engineering to convince them that it's possible and, uh, and it will actually work and take a bet on us. And uh, those are probably the two most challenging ones. Um, just overcoming that aversion to risk and, and the willingness to try something new and the fact that it does take a considerable longer amount of time to create a space company and a space product than it would take to create a software company or a software product. And then just to go back a little bit to, to Odyssey and what you guys are planning to do and to get a little bit esoteric and philosophical um, about it as well, why is it so important for humanity to communicate while in space? Communications is amazing. I mean, if you look at the history of, of humanity on the planet, there are many examples where, where communication completely changed society. Um, it had a huge impact, right? So when the telephone came about or the telegraph, that had a big difference. Um, there was actually a, a case I started in business school, which was really interesting, where there was a fish market in a third world country, and, uh, and there was another fish market in a neighboring city just a couple of miles down, down the coastline. And uh, the introduction of cell phone towers in, in that region had a huge impact on how people interacted because now people were able to compare pricing from one market to the other um, while still at sea on the boat and the fishermen would choose which harbor to go into to sell their fish. Um, so it has big economic impacts in terms of resource management. But even beyond that, I think for us, the, the real attraction is we can bring the astronaut closer to the audience. Space is awesome, right? Everybody loves seeing what's going on out there. How cool would it be if even on this show right now, we could have a live feed from something happening in space as we speak and just share that with the world and share that wonder and excitement and bring it to as many people as we could. And that's really what's driving us to do this more than anything else. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think a live feed's one of our Patreon uh, levels, $250,000 per episode, something <laughs> like that. So yeah, <laughs> that would be fantastic. So Ralph, thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, where can people get, uh, learn more about you and Odyssey? Well, you can find us online. We're at odyssey.space. That's our domain name. Um, you can see all the, um, the information on our website. And then there's ways to contact us there as well. Uh, we're also on Twitter, at Odyssey. And uh, we're actually physically located in, in sunny California, or actually currently it's rainy California, in downtown. <laughs> but if you're in the neighborhood, feel free to stop by and say hello. Yeah, and just uh, before you go, we've got five general questions that we ask all of our guests. Um, sure. And there's no right or wrong answer with these. These are just general run-of-the-mill questions, and feel free to answer them however you feel, however long you feel. So the first of the five questions is moon or Mars first? For me, it's moon first, but um, it could be at the same time for different reasons. I think one of the big enabling factors which is going to allow us to travel the solar system is a, a denser, more capable power source, which really means nuclear power. Uh, you don't want to develop, develop that on Earth. It's too dangerous. Um, having a permanent habitat on the moon would allow you to do that, and then the solar system is really your oyster. So I would do moon first. All right. And about space, would you go to space? Heck yeah. I actually <laughs> applied being an astronaut. Um, that was part of my goals after getting my PhD. I did not make the cut. 
but uh, that didn't stop me from trying to contribute anyway again. <laughs> and then, uh, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? That is an interesting question, predicting the future. Um, I would say no matter when it is, it will be later than I would like. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, I like that one. And uh, when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Pretty much the same answer, right? I mean, there's a lot that could be done there. Um, I think the goal really is, or the, the, the aim really should be, the next time we go, we have to go to stay. And that's much more important than, than when we get there. Because it can't be just a one-off thing. Um, as exciting as that was, we do want to make it a stepping stone to even greater and bigger things. Yeah. And then the final question, one of my, my favorite question to always ask people, why space? <laughs> why not? I mean, for me, I've always been a consummate explorer at heart. For me, even as a child, I always ask questions like, how do we get there? What is there? What is it like to be there? What's over there on the other side of whatever that something was? And my life really started in a tiny village in Germany, which had a bakery, a bank, and a butcher shop, and that was it. And then I was just driven to keep pushing outwards and seeing a bigger and larger world. And for me, looking in the sky, seeing the moon hanging over my head, that's a world. It's as diverse and as interesting and as curious as anything around us on Earth. And there are literally millions or billions more. So how could you not want to know what is there and experience it yourself? And Ralph, thank you again for coming on the show today. Ralph Iwig from Odyssey, the CEO, very interesting communication systems in space. So thank you very much, guys. The show was great. Yeah, thank you again. <laughs> so we'll be right back after this break. Stay tuned. It's comments coming up. And welcome back. Before we get started on comments from last week's show, we did want to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons who've been contributing to the show. I want to thank our Escape Velocity members who've been contributing $10 or more and they get access to the Slack channel. Our Orbital members contributing $5 or more, up to $9.99. They get the uh, free worldwide swag store shipping, as well as our suborbital uh, members who are contributing $2.50 or more. And they get the, the early access to our After Dark, which we do after each show. And of course, we cannot forget the most important, our ground support members. These are the folks who are contributing $1 or more per show, up to $2.49. You get your name in the show, as well as access to our quarterly Google Hangouts, which we need to do one very soon. And we just want to thank every single one of you awesome people who are contributing to the show and making this happen. If you'd like to find more information, if you haven't uh, signed up already, you can visit patreon.com slash tmro to sign up at whatever level that you feel is appropriate to support the show. And just thank you again to each yes. and every one of you who are supporting us. Totally. And thank like you. Destructor1701 says in the, in the uh, chat room, Mike is kicking ass on this with zero notice. So yes, great <laughs> job with that. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you, you, Mike. Uh, aw, so proud. So last week's show, what, what, what was last week's show? I wasn't even here. I was in the shop for repairs, so I, I didn't download the memory Right, link. how is the update feeling? Are you doing a little bit better now? It's, yeah. it's doing okay. I, I feel a little glitchy in the legs, but, but I think things are good. <laughs> yeah, well, well. We'll get yeah. there. Just you know, a little bit. It's, uh, <laughs> it's fine. Um, last, 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 week. <laughs> last week we visited with uh, Dave Disler again about the EM drive. He gave us an update there. Oh, that joke will never get old. Um, nope. <laughs> yeah. So we we talked a little bit more about the EM drive. Uh, what's been you know what he's been doing the last uh, year or so. Uh, there was some peer review kind of stuff going on. Yeah. We had a visit from a cat. That was very cool. Uh, <laughs> Oh, no, no, that was yours, wasn't it? Yeah, Never that mind. was my other interview. Oh, I am so. just... I, it's all right. It's all happens. just... It's all doing together. this. I could, maybe, <laughs> maybe I need an update next. All right. Uh, <laughs> 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 yes, that's, that's the general thing of what happened uh, this last episode. So let's move
move on to comments. These, again, all came from YouTube. You guys are just really prolific over there, which is awesome. Really liking that. Um, yeah. Feel free, of course, to always comment on our Patreon page. Uh, you can tweet at us. Uh, we take comments on Facebook. Uh, just YouTube happens to be the place where all these are lately. All right, the first <laughs> one comes from uh, somebody calling themselves Musky Elon. I kind of get the feeling that a lot of these comments were chosen because of the screen names, but we'll get to that in a second. Ew. This one says, uh, it's good to hear that some money is going to the e into the EM drive. We can explain it later. We just really need to know if it works in space. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Just toss some money at it and throw one into space and see if it actually works. So good way to do most things i mean I would I, say. I, yeah I, I guess would not i mean yes but no but yes but no like you can't just like be randomly tossing money around and going ah, that didn't work let's try this one now like you think there should be a little bit of basis for it shows you how much i know about business Something, yeah, well, do you that's remember that's who I mean, you're married to <laughs> oh yes so oh. i speak I mean, no. from experience sick burn oh <laughs> let's be clear oh but i mean at NASA, though, the program that is, is doing this, NASA Eagle Works, and you know, kind yes. of by extension, the Advanced uh, um, uh, Innovative Concepts, you know, there's a lot of really good ideas that come out of both of those offices, and most of them don't go anywhere after, you know, they get presented of, hey, this is a really cool idea. So, you know, even though it's not necessarily saying, oh, let's throw money at a problem, it's not necessarily a problem, but, you know, I agree with Muskie Elon here that, you know, it's good to see, you know, money going into it, and that we'll yeah. eventually see some sort of demo mission, and I mean, if this works, then you know we're going to be able to start sending out a lot more New Horizons probes uh, with uh, no fuel. It's going to be great. So, Makes me uh, very happy. This, right. I mean, the, there's there's definitely a balance. I, although Chris Radcliffe says in the chat room, well, then that makes it the expend money drive. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Oh I my gosh. Know. Like that. Uh, okay, so next one comes off of YouTube. This one comes from a Tiberius Maximus. Like I said, maybe it's all in the name. Uh, it says, I would like to know what the biggest chunk of ring material there is, like an asteroid size. Because the reason I ask is because they would make some nice service stations since it's mostly water ice. Can anyone answer this? Yes, I can. Let me just get my little you know, Ooh. science ready oh, yeah. to go uh -oh. here. Go ahead. Uh -oh. um, well, the <laughs> largest chunks of ring material are what you would end up calling these little moonlets that appear there. And they can be anywhere from uh, a couple hundred meters in size to a couple kilometers in size. So a moonlet um, is smaller than a plutoid? Yes. Okay, just it's, checking. It's, it's, I just want to make sure I get my... It's like a moon, but on the up and coming. You know, it's, it's like, like a dwarf infant. moon. It's a dwarf moon. Oh. It's the way to do it. So, yeah. <laughs> In the embryo stage. What yeah. are we doing? <laughs> just making sure I understand. It's kind of like, you know, there's the European shoe sizes and then the U.S. shoe sizes. Yes. And they're similar, but they're not the same. Yeah. All right. Go, perfect. Go kinda. on. That's how it goes. All right. So it's, give me more uh, moon ice, moonlit things. I don't on. know if they would be a good place to go to because there's a lot of static buildup in the rings oh. so if you have a ship that if like if you fly a spacecraft through the rings a lot of that ring material could end up actually sticking to your spacecraft um, because of static buildup. Oh, and then you there. become your own moonlit. Yes, and that's not, yeah. <laughs> not the best place for a servicing station. But there are some moonlets that have actually sort of carved out these gaps in the ring. So maybe those are the ones you can go to. So Interesting. Yeah. Like there's one called Daphnis which we just recently got some unbelievable imagery of, which um, somewhere in the comments, once this episode's up, I'll put a link to the image of it where you can actually see it pulling material off of the ring um, huh. towards it, So, which is just, again, the Cassini mission, one of my favorite missions in terms of the imagery we get back from it. It's just a fan fantastic all around what we've learned from Saturn. So Interesting. All right. Very, Very cool. cool. Uh, <laughs> this... <laughs> This next comment also comes off of YouTube. Ah, the username, the large had hard on collider. Not hadron. Not 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 the hadron? Not nope. the hadron. Nope, I had to read that about eight times before oh. I made sure I was reading My that correctly. Gosh. Well, we do have the disclaimer before the show, so Well, yeah, there's I that's I'm just reading the words on the screen. Okay. Uh, don't know if you guys mentioned it on the show before, but Juno is one of the only spacecraft to use solar panels out at that distance, and they are huge. All the others going out that far rely on RTGs, which I had to look up, is a radio radiosotope 
Thermo. Isotope. Radio Radio isotopes, isotopes. Oh thermoelectric my. generator. Perfect. I wrote it down and I still couldn't read it. So it's all good. <laughs> oh, why am I doing the show? <laughs> this is, no. it's fine. I can't read anything, you guys. Okay. Anyhow. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Do you know why they're using solar panels as opposed to the RTG thing that I can't read? Well, there's just frankly well, not a lot. Oh, you want to take it, Space Mike? Well, yeah, you go, go ahead and, and, uh, and get on your point. Um, uh, there isn't a whole lot. What these, uh, these are is it's a type of ur uh, plutonium, if I'm not cor Correct me if I'm wrong. Is it plutonium that or is, is it uranium? Correct. It's plutonium. It's okay. So this plutonium uh, expels heat as it's, as it's decaying, and that heat they are able to convert into energy, and that's what these RTGs are. And... Um, there isn't a whole lot of plutonium available for this. What little bit we have, we're trying to save for some of the bigger missions. You know, we definitely needed it for New Horizons to go way out there. Because, right. I mean, with Jupiter, you still are getting enough with these next generation solar panels. The solar mm -hmm. panels on Juno are a different type that have more efficiency than the, the, the um, uh, normal type of silicon yep. uh, solar panels that are on most spacecraft today. So they're able to get a lot more energy and they're a lot more sensitive. So so even at that distance, you know, they're still collecting about as, you know, as much energy as <laughs> something that you could get like from Radio Shack or something like that. But at that distance, yeah. they are able to filter it and get as, as much as it, out of it as they possibly can. So this was kind of a test in a way to even see if we could uh, get that much energy from solar panels, something as far out as Jupiter. So uh, both of those reasons, both for the uh, shortage of the type of plutonium that we would need for this, as well as... Uh, uh, trying out this uh, this better uh, solar panel technology. Yeah, and if I remember right, those solar panels are if uh, two thirds the length of a tennis court each of them. Oh, so they're pretty gigantic. Yeah. Um, and then in addition to that, out at Jupiter, you only get four percent of the light output of the sun that you get or in, in and around Earth's orbit. So. Um, yeah, so even with those massive solar panels, it's still only generating a couple hundred watts of power. So. Silly question, that's not because the the panels themselves are inefficient, inefficient, it's because there isn't a lot of light to be caught out there? Exactly. Okay. That's exactly what it is. <sighs> Sometimes I learn and things. Like, think about it like this, like by the time you're out to Pluto distance, our star just kind of looks like a really bright star, you know, right. it doesn't even yeah. look, you know, very much like a sun, and if you got turned around, you might even lose it type of thing, you know, so. Yeah, out of Pluto, uh, it's about a third of a percent, so. It's, oh, it's even, crazy. It's even less than at Jupiter. That's so, so. And in fact, there's a really cool thing that you can do. I don't know if it's still on NASA's website, but when the New Horizons mission flew by Pluto, um, they had a thing on their website called Pluto Time, where you could actually input your location on the Earth, and it would tell you what time to go outside at, so okay. that you could see the amount of light that you would be able to see on Pluto. Huh. And it was literally something like the equivalent of like like eight to ten full moons worth of light. So it was like a ridiculously low amount of yeah, light. Yeah, yeah. So huh. it was wow. pretty cool. Interesting. All right. <laughs> cool. All right. So this next comment also off of YouTube comes from Streetwind. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, I don't think you guys need to worry about Ariane 5 launching JWST, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. Yep. That rocket is literally, look it up, the most reliably, reliable heavy class lifter that has ever existed. It's been over 14 years since any Ariane rocket has had any sort of issue. Since then, 76 missions have gone up flawlessly. Rest assured, there exists no safer rocket in the world in which to conduct this launch. I don't know about flawlessly, but they, they were successful. I'll yeah. give you that much. They're very good. Um, and, you know, successful and nominal all, that sound like not like super flowery uh, words or verbiage. But, uh, yeah, so I, I did look it up because I was curious. It's one of those things where I know about some rockets. I, I If you line them up, I may or may not be able to tell you which one is which. <laughs> and I, I certainly am not very good at reliability. So I, I definitely had to... Uh, I was interested about that. Um, yeah, uh, Arian has a really, really good track record, really amazing track record, and 76 missions in a row, in a row, I apologize, um, is is something, I, I'm just, I must be a pessimist at heart. I'm one of those people who doesn't like to go <laughs> on roller coasters a whole lot. Like, I like some roller coasters, but not a lot of roller coasters, and if it's made out of wood, I'm definitely not going on it, because today <laughs> is going to be the day that it breaks on me, and I, I just, I don't know what sort of weird, like, pessimistic, superstitious thing that got into my head as a little kid, but, so, 
It there's, happens. There's the wood knocking and the things and the my word to whatever imaginary friend you believe in. Um, I, I all of those things. Uh, but otherwise, it sounds statistically speaking, it does sound like it would be one of the better rockets to uh, to launch on. Yeah. And to be honest, that's probably why NASA chose the Ariane 5 in the first place. I mean, I'm sure if you asked someone from United Launch Alliance, they'd be like, well, uh, I would say that, you know, our, our Atlas are probably some of the, uh, also one of the safest rockets in the world. So it depends on who you ask. Sure. But, yes. I mean, it's true, though, that they haven't had any problems. I mean, most of the problems that they have had were with, like, Ariane 3 and 4. So they haven't had a whole lot of problems with uh, Ariane 5. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that, will, that, that mission will be, will not like be a, will, won't be like your fear of roller coasters where that will be the day that something goes wrong and if it does then <laughs> Chris Radcliffe uh, says never say nothing can go I wrong yeah, yeah. Just, uh, uh, I, I just hope that it works because this has been a really long time coming and I just want the data from that telescope already so uh, this, is, this is very true I want the data I want the data <laughs> give me the data all right this next comment made me laugh out loud uh, this one comes off of YouTube this is from uh, T1 John. It says, uh, it was great to hear from Dave Disler again. I've been subscribed to his YouTube channel ever since his appearance on Tomorrow Last Summer. But since then, he's updated about 300 hours of cat videos in about 10 minutes from the EM drive. LOL. Laughing out loud, in case you didn't know. Not love you lots. Uh, don't get me wrong, Dave. <laughs> love your cats. But it's nice to hear about the st uh, status of your research, too. In particular, I'm glad to hear the recent peer-reviewed paper is being taken seriously, at least by some. It's about time the scientific community stopped treating this as just another perpetual motion scam and actually tried to figure out what the heck is going on there. I see your work as a major contribution toward that end. Keep up the good work and keep the vet cat vids coming. Yes, cat videos. <laughs> it's the internet, after all. <laughs> we love the internet. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, right. Well, I mean, me outer space. Yeah, take me to me outer space. Yeah, which or visit me outer space, because yeah, I'm, I'm not going anytime soon. Although we determined earlier, I am of correct stature to do so. Yes, you are. That's perfect. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, that's funny. Uh, I, it's one of those things. It's like. Uh, when we thought Bert Rattan's uh, Twitter account was real, and yes. all he talked about was gourmet burgers, burgers for a really long time. Yes. Uh, but Dave is a real life person. He does put in lots of videos. Much of them are cats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's it's cats. That there's really not a whole lot else to say. There is there. Okay. Cats. So, uh, last comment. Uh, <laughs> this one comes off of YouTube. Uh, this one comes from a Ricky Lake. And for those of you who are <gasps> old enough Lake? to remember like Ricky Lake, uh, very clearly, Ricky here says, Hello, this is Ricky Lake. No, not the talk show host. Oh, exactly. Uh, bummer. Got that out That's of That's all way. right, though. We're still glad you're watching. I <laughs> started watching and, con <laughs> and contributing to get my children, Crystal and Carson, passionate about space for the human species' future. Uh, that another ELE or extension level event will happen again, not, but if, when. Uh, we must become interplanetary to survive. Go SpaceX. I have tried to email this to my read Capcom on your show. No luck yet, so I can tell my children, please subscribe and contribute to TMRO. I know I am just ground crew, but I'm going to tell my children to watch tomorrow YouTube Orbit 10.06. So here we are. Hello, Crystal and Carson. You got your name in the show. <laughs> you got your name in the show. Right? Your name in the show. I mean, really, <laughs> Ricky Lake's name should was always in be in the, the ground show. crew, so <laughs> Ricky could always say... They're, yeah, we could do that. We could just throw their names on ground crew. Well, I mean, so. like, but Ricky, Ricky already is. Yeah, I know. But he's... why not also put uh, Crystal and Carson on well, ground crew? I think as well? we've. I, they're in the show now. Maybe in parentheses. Forever. Well, they are now. Here, once we get the lower <laughs> third thing set up, they are now immortalized <laughs> on the internets. Oh, <laughs> which is just gracious. a great place to be immortalized. I hope Wait Ben's not watching anymore. Anyway, so yes. uh, that's it for this week. Next week, we will be graced with the in-studio presence of the everyday astronaut, <gasps> which is really back. exciting. He's that'll back. Because that'll be the first time, that it won't be the first time that everyday astronaut's been in the studio, but it'll be the first time since we've had the new observation deck studio. Yes, yes. So that's really exciting. Because he was here when we had just the the OG studio. Yeah. When it was just the chairs and a table yeah. and a screen. But and now, now it's, it's just, like, a, so, now we're just standing with no chairs. And a table and a so wait a minute, is our airlock working yet? Because I'm really seeing him trying to come in from the outside first in his suit. <laughs> you know what? That's the great thing about Everyday Astronaut is that he comes with his own suit. 
At so, least he has a suit. Yeah, right. he does have his own suit. Right. That's so. why we have yet to have anybody live on the observation deck. How's that for an answer? <laughs> well, that's going to break it in pretty well. So. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! Okay, so what? Uh, what else? So yeah, that's it, right? That's it. That's, that's the show. That's it. That's awesome. a show. Yay! <laughs> Woo! One more down in the history books. Oh, that's it for this week. I can't wait for After Dark, you guys. I don't know about you. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining, joining us, us everybody. <laughs> we'll see you, see you later. <laughs> Bye.